live from Barcelona, Spain, it's theCUBE. Covering KubeCon CloudNativeCon Europe 2019. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and Ecosystem Partners. Welcome back to theCUBE here at KubeCon CloudNativeCon 2019 in Barcelona, Spain. I'm Stu Miniman, my co-host is Corey Quinn, and we're thrilled to welcome to the program two gentlemen from CERN. Of course, CERN needs no introduction. We're going to talk some science, going to talk some tech. Uh, to my right here is Ricardo Rocha, who is the computer engineer, and Lucas Heinrich, who's a physicist. So, Lucas, let, let's start with you. You know, if you're a traditional enterprise, we talk about your business, but talk about your projects, your applications. What 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 piece of you know fantastic science is, is your team working on? Right. So I work uh, on an experiment uh, that is uh, situated with the Large Hadron Collider. So it's a particle accelerator experiment where we accelerate uh, protons, which are hydrogen nuclei, to a very high energy so that they almost go uh, with the speed of light. And so we have a large tunnel underground, 100 meters underground in Geneva, so straddling the border of uh, France and Switzerland. And there we're accelerating two beams. One is going clockwise, the other one is going counterclockwise. Mm -hmm. And there we collide them. And so I work on an experiment that kind of looks at these collisions and then analyzes this data. Yeah, Lucas, if I can, you know, when you talk to most companies, you talk about scale, you talk about latency, you talk about right. performance. Uh, those have real world implications for right. your world. Maybe, you could, do, do you have anything yeah, you so can share there? Yeah, so one of the main things that we need to do, so we uh, collide uh, 40 million times a second, uh, these protons, and we need to analyze them in real time because we cannot write out all the collision data to disk because we don't have enough disk space. <laughs> and so we essentially run uh, you know, 10,000 uh, core real-time application to analyze this data in real time and uh, see what collisions are actually most interesting and then only those get written out to disk. So this is a system that I work on called the Trigger. And yeah, that's uh, pretty uh, dependent on latency. All right, Ricardo, luckily, you know, your job's easy. We say most people, you need to respond, uh, you know, to, to, to what the business needs for you, and, you know, don't worry, you, you know, you can't go against the laws of physics. Well, you're, you're working on physics here, right. and boy, those are some hefty requirements there. Talk a little bit about that dynamic and how your team, uh, you know, has, has, has to deal with some uh, pretty, pretty tough challenges. Right, so, as Lucas was saying, we have this uh, large amount of data, this can, the, the machines can generate something on the order of petabyte a second, and then <laughs> thanks to their hardware and software level triggers, they will reduce this to something that is 10 gigabyte a second, and that's what my side has to handle. So it's still a lot of data. We are collecting something like 70 petabytes a year, and uh, we keep adding. So right now we have uh, the amount of storage available is uh, on the order of uh, 400 petabytes. We're starting to get uh, at a pretty large scale. And then we have to analyze all of this. So we have one big data center uh, at CERN, uh, which is 300,000 cores or something like this uh, around that, but we that's not enough. Uh, so what we've done over the last uh, 15, 20 years, we created this large distributed computing environment around the world. We linked to many different institutes and uh, research labs uh, together, and this doubles our capacity. So that's our challenge, is to make sure that all the effort that the physicists put into building this large machine uh, that in the end, we, it's not a computing that is breaking uh, the whole system. We, we have to keep up. Uh, yep. One thing that I always find fascinating is people who are dealing with real problems that are that, that I push our conception of what scale starts to look like. And when you're talking about things like a petabyte a second, that, that's beyond the comprehension of what most of us can wind up uh, talking about. One problem that I've seen historically with a number of different infrastructure approaches is it requires a fair level of complexity to go from this problem to this problem to this problem and you have to wind up working through a bunch of layers of abstraction and at the end result is, and at the end of all of this, we can run our blog that gets eight visits a day. And, and that just doesn't seem to make sense. Whereas what you're talking about, that level of complexity is more than justified. So my question for you is, as you start seeing these things evolve, and looking at other best practices and guidance from folks who are doing far less data intensive applications, are you seeing that a lot of the best practices start to fall down as you're pushing uh, theoretical boundaries of scale? Right, that's uh, actually a good point. Like the physicists are very good at getting things done and they don't worry that much about the process uh, as long as in the end it works. Uh, but like there's always this uh, kind of uh, split between the physicists and the more computing engineer where the practices, we want to establish practices. 
but at the end of the day, like we have a large machine that has to work, so sometimes we skip uh, a couple of steps, uh, but it, we still need, to, th there's still quite a lot of control on like data quality and uh, the software validation and all of this. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a non-traditional uh, environment in terms of IT, I would say. It's much more fast pacing than most traditional companies. Now you mentioned you had how many cores working on these problems on site? So in-house we have uh, 300,000. Uh, yeah. If you were to do a full migration to the public cloud, you'd almost have to repurpose that many cores just to calculating out the bill at that point. Just because all the different dimensions everything winds up working on at that scale becomes almost completely non-trivial. I don't often say that I'm not sure public cloud can scale to the level that someone would yeah. need to. In your case, that becomes a very real concern. Yeah, so th that's one debate we are having now and it's, uh, uh, it, it has a lot of advantages to have the computing in-house and also because we pretty much use it 24-7, it's a very different type of workload. So we need a lot of resources 24-7, so like even the, the pricing is kind of calculated differently. But uh, we, the issue we have now is that the, uh, the accelerator will go through a major upgrade just in five years time, where we will increase the amount of data by 100 times. So we're now we're talking about 70 petabytes a year and we're very soon talking about like exabytes. So the amount of computing we'll need there is, uh, is just going to explode. So we need all the options. We need, we're looking into GPUs and machine learning to change uh, how we do computing and we are looking at uh, any kind of additional resources we might get and th there the public cloud will probably play a role. Yeah, c c can you speak to kind of the dynamic of how something like an upgrade of that, you know, how do you work together? Right. I can't imagine that you just say, well, we built it whatever we needed and everything and, you know, throw it over the wall right. and make sure it works. Right, I mean, so I work a lot on this boundary between computing and physics and mm -hmm. so internally I think we also go through the same processes as a lot of companies that we're trying to um, educate people like on the physics side how to go through the best practices because it's also important. So one thing that I stressed also in the keynote is uh, this idea of reproducibility and reusability of scientific software is pretty important. So we teach people to containerize their applications and make them reusable and uh, stuff like that. Yeah. Right. A a anything about that relationship you can expound on? Yeah, so like this, this keynote we had yesterday is a perfect example of how this is impr like improving a lot at CERN. So we were actually using data from CMS, which was one of the experiments. Lucas is a physicist in Atlas, which is like a computing experiment kind of. I'm in IT and uh, like all this containerized uh, uh, infrastructure uh, kind of is getting us all together because like uh, Computing is getting much easier in terms of uh, how to share uh, pieces of software and even infrastructure, and this helps us a lot uh, internally also. Uh. Yeah, uh, so what, what, what particular about Kubernetes helps your environment? You talked for 15 years you've been on this distributed systems yeah. build out, so sounds like uh, you, you, were, you were the hipsters when it came to uh, so some of these solutions we're working on today. So that, that has been uh, like a major change. Lucas mentioned the container part for the software reproducibility, but I've been working on the infrastructure for, uh, I joined CERN as a student and I've been working on the distributed infrastructure for many years. And we basically had to write our own uh, tools, like storage systems, all the batch systems uh, over the years. And suddenly, like with this public cloud explosion and open source usage, uh, we can just go and join communities that have requirements sometimes that are higher than ours. And uh, we can focus really on, on, on the application development. We, if we base, uh, if we start writing software using Kubernetes, then not only we get this flexibility of choosing different public clouds or, uh, or different infrastructures, but also we don't have to care so much about the core infrastructure, all the monitoring, log collection, uh, restarting. Uh, Kubernetes is very important for us in this respect. Uh, we kind of remove a lot of the software we, we, ha we were depending on for many years. Yeah. What's so these days, as you look at these at this build out and what you're looking, not just what you're doing today, but what you're looking to build in the in the upcoming uh, years, are you viewing containers as the fundamental primitive of what empowers this? Are you looking at virtual machines as that primitive? Are you looking at functions? I mean, what, what, how, where exactly do you uh, draw the abstraction layer as you start building this architecture? So yeah, traditionally we've been using uh, virtual machines for like the last uh, maybe ten years almost, or I don't know, eight years at least. Um, and we see con containerization happening very quickly. And uh, maybe Lucas can yeah. say a bit more about uh, the physics, how this is important on the physics side. Yeah, yeah what's been interesting, so currently I think we are looking at containers for the main abstraction because um, 
it's also we go to like things like functions as a service. What's kind of uh, special about um, scientific applications is that we don't usually just our, have our entire code base on one software stack, right? It's not like we deploy Node.js application or Python uh, stack and that's it. And so sometimes you have a complete mix between C++, Python, Fortran, and all that stuff. So this idea that we can build the entire software stack as we want it is pretty important. So even for functions as a service where traditionally you had just like a limited choice of runtimes, this becomes important. And like from our side, the virtual machine still had a very complex setup to be able to support all this uh, diversity of software. And the containerization, just uh, all the people have to give us is like, run this building block and it's kind of a standard interface. So we only have to build the infrastructure to be able to handle these pieces. Well, I don't think anyone can dispute that you folks are experts in taking larger things and breaking them down into constituent components thereof. I mean, yeah. you are quite obviously lead, lead world experts on that. But was there any challenge to you as you went through that process of, um, I, don't, I don't necessarily even want to say modernizing, but in changing your, your viewpoint of those primitives as you've evolved, are you start, have you seen that there were challenges in gaining buy-in throughout the organization? Uh, was there pushback? Was it, a, was it culturally painful to wind up moving away from the virtual machine approach into a containerized world? Right, so yeah. A bit, of course, but uh, traditionally we, like physicists, really focus on, on their end goal. We often say that uh, we don't ca count how many cores or whatever, we care about events per second, how many events we can process per second. So it's a kind of more uh, open-minded uh, community maybe than traditional IT, so uh, we don't care so much about which technology we use at, at some point, uh, as long as the job gets done. Uh, so yeah, there's a bit of traction sometimes, but uh, but there's also a push when you can demonstrate that we get a clear benefit. Then uh, it's, it's it's kind of easier to to push it. Yeah, what's well, a bit a little bit special, maybe also for uh, particle physics, that it's not only CERN that is a researcher. We are an international collaboration of uh, many many institutes all around the world that work on the same project, which is just hosted at CERN and so it's a very flat hierarchy and people do have the freedom to right. try out things and so it's not, we have like a top down uh, mandate what technology we use and then somebody tries something out if it works and people see a value in it, um, you know, you get uh, adoption from it. Yeah. The, the collaboration with the data volumes you're talking about as well has got to be intense. I think you're a little bit beyond the, okay, we ran the experiment, we put the data in Dropbox, go ahead right. and download right. it, you'll, right. you'll get that in only 18 short years. Right. It, it seems like there's absolutely oh yeah, that, that a That was one of the that. key points actually in the keynote is that, so a lot of the experiments at CERN have an open data policy where we release our data and um, so that's uh, great because we think it's important for uh, open science. Uh, but it was always a bit of a, a issue, like who can actually practically analyze this data uh, for people who don't have a data center. And so one of part of the uh, keynote was that we could demonstrate that using Kubernetes and public cloud infrastructure actually becomes possible for people who don't work at CERN to analyze this large-scale scientific data Yeah, I, I mean, maybe just for our audience, you know, the, 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 the punchline is rediscovering the Higgs boson right. in the public right. cloud. Okay, yeah. Maybe just, you know, gi give our audience a little bit of taste of that. Right, yeah, yeah so yeah. basically what we did is, so the Higgs boson was discovered in 2012 uh, by both Atlas and uh, CMS, and so part of that data, so we used open data from CMS, and part of that data has now been released publicly, and uh, basically this was a 70 terabyte uh, data set, which we, um, like thanks to our uh, Google Cloud partners could uh, put onto um, public cloud infrastructure and then we analyzed it on a large scale Kubernetes cluster. And uh, yeah, the main challenge there was minutes. that like, we publish it and then we say you probably need a month to process it, but we had like 20 minutes on the keynote so we kind of right. it, needed a bit larger infrastructure than usual to, to run it like um, down to five minutes or less. So in the end it all worked out, but uh, that, that was a bit of a challenge. Yeah. Um, how are you approaching, I guess, making this more accessible to more people? By which I mean not just other research institutions scattered around the world, but students, individual students, uh, sometimes in emerging economies where they don't have access to the kinds of resources that many of us take for granted, particularly work for prestigious research institutions. Yeah, right. What are you doing to make, I guess, this more accessible to I don't know, high school kids, for example, yeah. folks oh. who are just dipping their toes into a world they find fascinating? Yeah, we have uh, entire programs, outreach programs uh, that go to high schools. So I've been doing this when I was a student in uh, Germany. We, we would go to uh, high schools and we would like ho host workshops and people would analyze a lot of this data um, 
you know, themselves on their computer. So we would come with a USB sticks that have data on them and they could uh, analyze it. And so part of uh, also for, uh, the open data strategy from Atlas is to use that open data for educational purposes. And then there are uh, also programs in emerging uh, countries. Right, well, Lucas and Ricardo, really appreciate you sharing Thank the you. open data, uh, yeah. open science uh, yeah, mission that you have uh, with our audience. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. All right, for Corey Quinn, I'm Stu Miniman. Uh, we're in day two of two days live coverage here at KubeCon, CloudNativeCon 2019. Thank you for watching theCUBE.